Welcome, and I am your narrator. In today's episode, I will introduce you to Harry Cohn, who, like everything else, worked hard to earn the title of Hollywood's most hated man. In our day, the so-called Me Too movement is at its peak. Through it, numerous women have spoken out who have become victims of sexual violence or harassment. The scandal erupted predictably in Hollywood, tarnishing the reputations of several producers and television personalities, such as the high-profile cases of Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby, which garnered significant media attention. Although their actions are also extremely terrible and shocking, they seem like mere choir boys compared to one of the most influential figures of Hollywood's golden age, Harry Cohn. Cohn ruthlessly trampled over everyone if his interest demanded it, and he is credited with popularizing the casting couch in the film industry. He wielded such power that even the Mafia didn't dare to cross him. It's no wonder he earned the title of Hollywood's most hated man, but this didn't bother him in the least. He rather enjoyed this role. I may be known as a crude, loudmouth son of a bitch, but I built Columbia. I started it with spit and wire in these fists. I stole, cheated, and beat people's brains out. Columbia is not just my love. It's my baby, my life. I'd die without Columbia. Little Harry was born as the third child of a German-Russian-Jewish family with five children who immigrated to America in New York on July 23, 1891. His parents were working class, his father was a tailor. In the impoverished environment, the boy learned early on that he had to fight for everything in life. It became his big dream that as an adult, no one could rule over him. He wanted to be his own boss. He dropped out of school at the age of 14 and tried to make a living with various jobs. He worked as a salesman and a tram driver, among other things. He first came into contact with the show business at the age of 19 when he worked briefly with Harry Ruby, a composer. He then started his own business selling sheet music. One of his early successful ideas was to make his own short films where actors perform popular songs. During the First World War, Cohn served in the US Army. After his discharge, he got a job at Universal Pictures where his brother Jacob Cohn had already had a successful career with a series that provided a glimpse into the lives of stars off screen. In 1919, the two brothers left Universal, and together with their lawyer friend, Joe Brandt, founded CBC, named after the initials of the three of them. But the company was not particularly successful. They mainly produced low-budget B-category films. Harry directed the film production, while his brother dealt with finances. Their relationship was extremely volatile. Despite their collaboration, they were not close to each other and conflicts were daily occurrences. Brandt found working with the brothers too stressful, so he sold his share of the company to Harry, who thus became the president of the company and changed their name to Columbia Pictures Corporation. The studio's milestone came in 1934, when their film, It Happened One Night, won Oscars in five major categories. After that, they started to ensure that alongside low-budget films, they also released an A-category film every year with A-list actors. To reduce costs, they borrowed established actors from other studios for one film each while they signed up budding novice actors for Columbia. Some of them later became successful, such as Cary Grant or Rita Hayworth. Harry Cohn was by no means charming or likable. With his increased power, he constantly abused it and made life miserable for those around him. He behaved like a dictator, believing that he could only motivate his subordinates with control and intimidation and yet they remained loyal to him. He had a huge, adjustable desk in his office, and visitors had to sit on very low chairs, so they were dwarfed in front of Cone. In the drawer of this desk, he kept a cherished 
autographed picture of Mussolini, whom he greatly admired. Cohn took great pleasure in eavesdropping on private conversations of his employees, for example, through microphones placed in dressing rooms. If anything was said that displeased him, he would play the conversation in front of the entire studio, thus embarrassing the participants. To maintain his power, he also maintained good relations with organized crime, including John Rosselli, a powerful Chicago Italian mobster, and Abner Zwillman, the leader of the New Jersey Jewish underworld. He treated his employees roughly, the slightest reason was enough for him to dismiss them, and he particularly enjoyed firing his subordinates on Christmas Eve. Once there was a problem during the making of a film because they couldn't come up with a suitable story, Cohn suggested a story, but it didn't please the film's two producers, so they hired a new writer with whom they jointly created the film's plot. They presented their idea to Cohn with the words, Look, Harry, we think this is much better three against one. Cohn then walked up to the window, spat on it, and replied, You're wrong. It's one against nothing. See that street down there? It's paved with the bones of my producers. Even Peter Falk, who played Columbo, had a bad experience with Cohn. It was well known that Falk lost one of his eyes due to cancer at the age of three. Once he met Columbia's head, who said to him, Mr. Falk, for this price, I could get an actor with both eyes. It was well known that actresses employed by Columbia had to establish sexual relationships with Cohn in order to get a role in a movie. Cohn wasn't satisfied with just that. After the intercourse, women received small gifts from him, such as stockings or perfume, essentially paying for the act so that women would feel even cheaper, and then he continuously spied on them and interfered in their private lives. Established stars could afford to say no to him, like Joan Crawford, who even threatened to tell everything to his wife if he didn't back off. Jean Arthur, an actress, stated in an interview that the actress's dressing rooms at Columbia were arranged in a row, connected by a dark corridor. There was a secret entrance the Cone used to enter the dressing rooms and abuse the women. Jean decided to kill Cone. She waited for three hours in the dark to shoot him, but eventually changed her mind and left Columbia. The most shocking case was that of Kim Novak and Sammy Davis Jr. Kim Novak was one of the biggest movie stars of the era and a sex symbol, while Sammy Davis Jr was a famous singer and dancer. The two celebrities got involved in a relationship, which Cohn didn't look upon favorably for several reasons. Firstly, in 1950s America, it wasn't acceptable for a white woman to be in a relationship with a black man, and Cohn feared that Novak's reputation would suffer, even though they had invested a lot of money in boosting her image. Secondly, Cohn had long been envious of the blonde beauty, and as he put it, he was bothered that the woman found this ugly black man more attractive than him. Cohn foamed with anger, and the fate of the lovers was sealed. He used his mafia connections and hired John Roselli, a gangster, to intimidate the man. Roselli kidnapped Sammy Davis Jr. and held him captive for several hours, threatening to break his legs and gouge out his eyes if he didn't end his relationship with the actress within two days and marry a black woman before the end of the year. Davis was scared by the threat, having already lost sight in one eye due to a car accident, so the prospect of being blinded deeply affected him. He tried to seek help from his acquaintance, Sam Giancana, the leader of the Chicago Mafia, but Giancana told him he couldn't protect him in California and advised him to settle things with Harry Cohn as soon as possible. DeVise had no choice but to bow to Cohn's will and paid $25,000 to marry a black dancer, Lore White. 
with the condition that they would divorce before the end of the year, which eventually happened, and the storm clouds cleared from the singer's head. Harry Cohn unexpectedly passed away from a heart attack in 1958 at the age of 67, causing relief to many in Hollywood, but the inhumanity of the studios and their leaders remained a common problem. In our next installment, we will delve into the deeds of Eddie Mannix, who rightfully earned the nickname the cleaner and a fucking gangster of Hollywood in that era. I've been your narrator. If you enjoyed this segment, please like and subscribe to the channel. And remember, the darkest stories are always written by life itself.